How do you explain the unexplainable? That warmth that fills you up from the inside out? Does it come from the air, the sea, the sun, the people? Or is it something that can't be put into words? Because Aruba is more than a beautiful island. It's a feeling that brings out a happier, sunnier you. That's the Aruba Effect. Plan your next visit at aruba.com. On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Adelaide. And Adelaide was in a 10-year toxic relationship with a dehumanizing wealthy abuser. It's a story of financial abuse, isolation, infidelity, and threats. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. This is a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of domestic violence. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. And... Also, everyone, before we get into the show, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We are going to be doing a 5K run on October 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can walk it. If you're in a wheelchair, you can go by wheelchair. You can do it any any way you want. We're going to do 5 kilometers to 3.1 miles for you people in America. You can raise money yourself for an agency, a person, a shelter, or you can just do it for awareness, post it on your social media, social media hashtag run for DV. And we're, we're doing this for the whole month of October. I'll be training and putting this stuff on our TikTok. If you want to watch the behind the scenes of some training and behind the scenes of the show, you can watch it there. And for people that want to be on our show today, our Survivor Story podcast, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says guest form. You press that button and away we will go from there. You fill out the guest form. And also at our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com, we now have a community support button at the top of the page. And that button takes you to our very own safe social network. Our community members are on there posting in our forums. We have integrated Zoom support meetings. We have prompt books for these episodes to help you dig deeper and get more clarity in your relationships in life. You can create and run your own events from meditations to closer ceremonies. On the 6th this week, we will be doing candle lighting ceremony for the new moon for the new year. I want the new year for, for new beginnings. And our communities, our community members are all amazing. They're on there to support you when you need them. They'll cheer you on when you need them. And if you just uh, need support, come to NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page, community support button. Also, if you need support, go to DomesticShelters.com. Org. If you are someone you know are experiencing abuse, you are not alone. DomesticShelters.org offers an extensive library of articles and resources that can help you make sense of what you're experiencing. And if you need to connect with local resources like a shelter, you can do that there too and find ways to heal and move forward. So please do go to DomesticShelters.org to access this free resource. And... What else do I have here on my piece of paper? I don't know if I have anything else here today. Oh, I do. Everyone, go listen to Toxic Workplace Podcast at ToxicWorkplacePodcast.com or on Apple, wherever you want to go, what other other podcast services you may use. Look for Toxic Workplace, and it is run by Carly Mayshock, and Carly is a great host A lot of interesting stories about toxic workplaces. So if you also have a toxic workplace story, please do go to ToxicWorkplacePodcast.com. Submit your story there. Always looking for new stories, Carly is. And I think that may be it today. I'm looking down my list of things that I I should remember 
or I maybe I forgot to write them down, but I, I think that is it. Um, so this is an interesting episode and I say that because it's not just an interesting story. It's the, probably the longest words of wisdom we've ever had. And there was a lot of wisdom in these words of wisdom and you just should listen. There's a really interesting uh, thing with lawyers that she'd figured out that one lawyer told her that, that's in there that told Adelaide these things. So it's a, it's a, it's a great words of wisdom. It's really helpful. And the whole story is, is interesting. And, you know, um, Adelaide is very deliberate when, when she is uh, talking and you, you know, her, her pauses, there's, there's, depth to the pauses, uh, when she, when she's speaking. And I really want to thank Adelaide for, for being here, uh, or being on the show, uh, and helping so many people. I know this episode's going to help a lot of people. So a big thank you to Adelaide. And now without further ado, here is my episode with Adelaide. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, I have Adelaide. How are you? Hi, I'm wonderful. How are you? I am doing well, and we are about to hear the story of your 10-year relationship, where you started off as someone who had a lot going for them. You came from nothing and you worked hard and you met someone who was very wealthy and you eventually were in a world that you were not a part of before and a world that not too many people are a part of and that created its own set of circumstances and it became very scary and isolating so Thank you for for being here today to share your story. And without further ado, Adelaide, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I can honestly say now that I'm looking back on things that my childhood made me the perfect victim. Um, I grew up in a very small farming community. Uh, Typical family, you know, mom, dad, sister, uh, two and a half year age difference. Um, I think things were pretty normal growing up until about fourth grade. And that was the moment that I remember that things were bad. Um, I am still obviously healing and working through the things in my childhood um, so I'm not sure if I, if the situation is that I just wasn't old enough to realize that it was bad before fourth grade or if fourth grade was a turning point in my childhood. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. And at that point, his drinking drastically increased and with the in the addition of the drinking, the abuse obviously got worse. Um, he would drink on his way home from work in the car, come home, drink more. Um, by dinner time, he was wasted. And you know, a lot of people remember having great uh, childhood memories of family dinners, and my memories are the exact opposite. Um, We were always walking on eggshells around him. He would pick up his dinner plate and throw it across the room, shatter the dinner plate, uh, slap my sister across the face when she was mid-bite for no reason, uh, so hard that she would have a uh, hand imprint on her face. Um, My parents weren't around much. They really weren't parents. Um, I am the older sister, so I I took care of everything. I taught my sister how to ride her bike without training wheels. I taught my sister how to tie her shoes. Um, 
I remember one point that really stuck out in my head, and I don't know if your listeners or you are even aware of who this is, but we had McGruff the crime dog who came to my school. Um, and I think he was created, you know, on the war against drugs. And he brought in this case. And in the case were, you know, drug paraphernalia. And he came in with a, a police officer and, uh, they wanted to know if we had ever seen any of this stuff. And I looked in that case and realized that all of that stuff was in my home. I knew what all of that stuff was. Um, my younger sister and I were left home a lot alone. My parents worked. Um, naturally, we're curious. We go through my parents' bedroom. You know, we're going through my mom's stuff putting on her lipstick, things that normal little girls do. I'm finding vials of cocaine. I'm finding marijuana. I'm finding pills. So uh, I think that's where a lot of the issues in my family arose from. I distinctly remember every day that my dad would come home from work. I could hear him snorting lines of cocaine immediately walking into his bedroom. Now I'm sort of realizing that I believe my mom was a narcissist. She did not acknowledge any of the behavior and somehow found a way to make it all about her. Even though, you know, my sister is suffering, I'm suffering. It always was about her. Um, both my parents worked, but we never had any money. I learned at a very, very early age that if I wanted something, that I was going to have to find a way to buy it for myself. In fifth grade, I wanted to play the cello. Uh, my parents refused. So I went out and I got a babysitting job and I paid my payment booklet with a rent to own cello so I could play the cello. Um, I bought my own braces. I was babysitting and earning enough money to provide for myself, something that I think I have a very good work ethic, and I think this is probably why. Um, working a lot on weekends, now I'm older, weeknights, babysitting, uh, very active in sports, and I did ballet for my entire life. As I started to grow older, I started to notice, and so did my friends, that I would get a lot of attention from older men. Uh, we would go to the mall and walk around and my friends would just say things like, wow, that guy is just gawking at you, staring at you. You know, there were a lot of, uh, I, I got a lot of male attention as I grew into being a teenager. Um, I was uh, working also at the mall. I was making money doing modeling I got um, approached to work for a big modeling agency, and my parents were very agreeable until they found out they had to drive me somewhere, and then that was a no. We just had a crazy, unstable household. Um, I watched my father get arrested for drunk driving the second time in my own driveway. So while you were growing up here, you're now in your teenage years. It's yes. hard to see what issues had been forming. Are you trying to get the attention of your parents in any way? Are you someone where your voice didn't matter and you're trying to get your voice heard in a lot of ways? Uh, are you feeling good enough? What, I guess, are the issues that presented themselves which later on became a problem when it came to your boundaries easily being a or easily being um, pushed backwards or torn down that were created here. I don't think I. That's the whole point. Is I don't think I ever had anybody to create to tell me what boundaries are. I never had a, a mom who said men shouldn't hit you because. I witnessed my father hitting my mom. 
you know, there were so many things that happened that were just insane that there was never a, an adult who really was a parent and who provided guidance and provided stability or even basic parenting. So like an overall neglect had taken yeah. over yes. and you are the parent to your sister are yes. you the parent to your parents? Uh, at times, yes. Um, are, are you a people pleaser? I would say probably, yes. I think um, I learned to just put on a happy face and smile and everything's fine. And even though inside, I knew it wasn't fine. Were there situations in your home where things had to be fixed and you were the fixer? Um. Yes, a sort of. I mean, I think I was the only person when my dad started getting very violent to defend and get him to stop hitting and get him to stop, uh, you know, beating my mom up. Or, you know, I think it was up to me because no one else was going to do it. So you're a problem solver in a way, and your problem solving skills helped you become a hard worker, figuring out yes. work, figuring out all these things. And I'm getting ahead of myself because if everyone doesn't really know here, I really don't know much about your story at all. And, yes. uh, uh, you know, with this problem solving and even in these situations where you're helping your family and calming your dad down, maybe deep down you feel like you can, you're such a problem solver, you can change things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was always a, a thought or at least a hope. Mm -hmm. So after, I guess, high school is done, do you leave the home uh, right away or what, what happens? Imme immediately. Um, I, so I have two things I think that are important to point out before I leave high school. Okay. Um, we, as parents, my parents, everything was a secret that happened in the house, like I told you. Mm -hmm. um, we had CPS who came. We weren't allowed to tell. Um, everything was a big secret, not a normal childhood. The abuse was insane um, until one day my mom decided that she wanted to leave my father. So we're being, my sister and I are being instructed the whole time. You're not allowed to talk. You're not allowed to tell anyone what's going on inside the house. Then all of a sudden it's, you need to go to your counselor at school. You need to tell your counselor what's going on. You need to say this. You need to say that. So I go to my uh, counselor at my high school. I dump my bucket to him as my mom instructed and when I did that, instead of consoling me, he tried to kiss me and he uh, groped me, pretty much touched me very inappropriately. And I think that sort of had an impact on me long term because it's like I have all this stuff that's going on. I finally go to tell someone and that person betrays me. And I didn't tell my mom because she was going, they were going through a divorce. It was a crazy, crazy situation. Um, it, when that happens and do you, do you, especially at that age, do you understand the gravity of what had just happened and how did you cope? Um, I think I understood. I, I, I think I maybe internalized it and blamed myself because I had noticed, like I said, that I was getting a lot of male attention. And I thought, oh, I must have done something to make him do that because he's a counselor. Like, this is his job. He works in a school system. He probably doesn't do this to other people. You know, it was a lot of me thinking I had done something wrong. Um, as far as coping, I don't know. I feel like I didn't tell anybody really. I might have told my best friend at the time, but I think I just kept to myself. So after that happened, um, what 
what uh, transpired with your family. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Back in November, I became pretty burnt out because I was running this podcast and I was working my other job to keep this going. I was exhausted. I had no time for myself. My mood was pretty erratic. And on top of that, there's social obligations. And for me, having too many social obligations becomes a huge problem as I'm not the best at saying no. So I wasn't looking forward to December at all. And I was really burnt out. And, you know, life can be really overwhelming. And many people are burned out without even knowing it. You know, symptoms can include a lack of motivation, irritability, fatigue, and much more. We associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. And, uh, you know, our roles in life can lead us to feel burned out. So BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. And talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing this stress in your life. I'm a huge fan of BetterHelp myself. I use it from the safety and convenience from my own home. My counselor and I work on my anxiety issues, my codependency issues, and they helped me out a lot when trying to figure out a life balance when I just was getting burnt out all the time. You know, December, November, I was toast everyone. So to me, therapy is a place I can be vulnerable, I can work things out, and I can get the validation I need. And I cannot say enough about therapy as a whole and how it's helped me in my life. So BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you do not want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash nap. That's BetterHelp.com slash nap. Um, my parents did get a divorce, um, and I, we, my sister and I both ended up living with my mom. We, it was, you know, we had to move out of our childhood home. It was very upsetting. And then my mom would just leave. Um, at the time I was, I want to say 13 or 14, and my sister was two and a half years younger, she would leave $20 in a bowl and just disappear for the weekend. And wouldn't we wouldn't see her. So she was off dating, doing whatever, you know, living her life. And my sister and I were just, and, and where I grew up, it's not like we could walk into town or even, I don't even know if we had pizza delivery. You know, it was just so far, uh, out of, you know, a normal, like we didn't live in a city, I guess, is what I can say. Later on in high school, I was working two jobs. So that gave me the money to be able to move out and live on my own. I went to college. I had no financial help. I paid my way through by working at the restaurants. If I didn't have enough money to take classes for the semester, you know, I took what I could. I did what I could. It wasn't um, a normal, you know, four-year college program. Um, In the meantime, I was working full-time. By the age of 19, I was promoted to a management position. I was making more money than my mother financially. Um, I also was sort of supporting her a little, too because she would always call and complain that she didn't have any money and she didn't know how she was going to eat lunch. So I felt the need to help her out. My father died um, when I was 21. He struggled with alcohol and drugs and was in and out of rehab facilities He uh, actually died on my birthday. He never showed up to uh, meet me for my birthday dinner. And so that was hard. You know, there was a lot of unresolved issues from, I guess, 
going through what I went through and then never get, our childhood, never getting the therapy and then knowing that I could never fix things or talk about things. But I just powered through, you know, I dived into work. I got another promotion, still managing the restaurant. I was the youngest manager in the company. I uh, would go to all these wine tastings and things, but I couldn't legally even drink. Uh, A lot of my staff were much older than me, but I think I liked it. I loved my job. It gave me a lot of satisfaction. Um, When I was 24, I met my husband at my job. Um, He was a wine rep. We quickly got engaged, married pretty quickly. He was a very nice guy. Um, But I feel like I married him because that was what was expected. We were living together. He was Italian Catholic. You know, we were living in sin because we weren't married. I felt very pressured. Um, Big, huge wedding. I was walking down the aisle knowing that this wasn't going to work and it wasn't going to last. We just had a different value system. I think I wanted him to change and I thought he would change. And I think he wanted me to change. Um, You know, I, I realized I shouldn't have gotten married and Eventually, I was the one who ended the relationship. Um, I knew I really wanted to have a family and I wanted to have children, but I knew I did not want to have a family or children with him. And that was my sign. You know, my heart was telling me that. So when I was 27, I uh, filed for divorce. I moved back in with my mother still working at the same restaurant. Um, By that time, I had graduated from college. So this is sort of where my narc comes into the picture. Um, He was a regular at the restaurant. He came in, His uh, he had two older sons who lived across the street, and he would come in on a weekly basis and bring them dinner. We just got to know each other, just like, I mean, he was no different than any other person, any other regular that I had in the restaurant. I'm my friendly self. I'm talking, you know, getting to know people, checking on them. I get to know him. He offers me a job, tries to get me to go work for his company. As time went on, it was more and more frequent. The minute I filed for divorce, I took off my engagement ring. But I kept my wedding ring on because I didn't want to blur the lines between professional and my private life. And the day I took it off, he was like, where's your ring? What's going on? I told him that I filed for divorce. He instantly gave me his phone number. I said, thank you for this, but, you know, I am pretty traditional. Um, I'm not going to call you. I'm going through a divorce. I'm not looking for a relationship. I, it's my belief that I should get divorced, like finalize my divorce before I do anything. Um, I don't, I'm not interested in dating. I'm not interested in going out. I just, you know, I said, I'm just, I just want a friend. That's all I want is a friendship. That was Memorial Day weekend. In the summertime, we open up an entire restaurant on top. So it's like having two restaurants. That consumed all my time. I poured my time into my work. I was working, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 hours a week. Except now he's coming in more often. He's bringing more people in. He's bringing famous athletes in to meet me. He's bringing famous sports announcers to meet me. He's bringing, you know, CEOs of companies in. And I was so, like, wow. Sorry, so I have a question. Yes. I have a bunch of questions. Okay. 
within this time, first, what is his job? Uh, second, what is it about him that you either like or don't like about him up until this point? Obviously, he's persistent and persistent pays, persistence pays off. But is there anything that you find attractive about him uh, from his personality to charisma or anything like that? He owns car dealerships. And he is self-made. He did it all on his own. So that, to me, was very intriguing. You know, literally a self-made man. Did it all on his own. No help from anyone. Very charismatic. Very charming. uh, Very complimentary. Just was a real charmer. Knew the right things to say. My employees loved him. And it was like he just was this larger than life personality, such a nice person. You know, he's bringing his kids in. I see he's a good father. He's attentive, caring, but I, the physical attraction was not there. He was much older than me. So, and he was a little too pushy and a little too forward for my liking. So I felt like I needed to pump the brakes and I could see where this was going And I wasn't comfortable and I wasn't ready for anything like that in my life at the time. So you weren't ready for a relationship like this or or a relationship with someone who was pushy like this. But there were aspects of him that you liked. Did you ever have in this time, you know, you were dealing with him, I think, mostly at work. So were you ever having personal conversations? Did he get to know anything about you was he able to connect with you on anything of your interests or uh, seeing you in specific ways that you've never been seen before, uh, getting attention like you had never gotten before, uh, where you're more, le- more used to neglecting your life? Um, yeah. I mean, I think he slowly but surely weaseled his way in, found the slowest night, knew I was working on this night and would sit at the bar. And we would just talk. He would ask me questions. I, you know, I'm honest. I'm an open book. I never once, uh, I don't know. It's just, there's something about him where you feel like you can just trust him and pour out your life to him. And, and, and how long, sorry. And how long into the relationship are you at this point, as far as knowing him? I had known him as a regular at my restaurant for well over a year, maybe even two. Okay. Um, It was when I got divorced or filed for divorce um, in May that he really put on the charm and the pursuit. Um, And so now when he goes on this trip to Italy, um, it's in the fall, it's in October. And he calls me and tells me, hey, I'm going on this trip. Um, I'm going to really miss seeing you. Can you just go outside for one second? I'm going to be driving by. I want to give you something. And it's slow, so I go outside. He rolls down the window and throws a bundle of cash. It's $10,000. Throws it at me. Says, I'm going to miss you. Take yourself shopping. You work so hard. You deserve this. I'll talk to you when I get back and drives away. And I was like in shock. I'm like, who, number one, carries $10,000 in cash with them? Number two, I can't accept this. And so I get home and I have it. I don't know what to do with it. Like, it just was shocking, right? We were also both going through a divorce at the same time that I would find out a little bit later. But the only difference was his ex-wife wanted $100 million in the divorce. And my ex and I were fighting over an espresso machine and a bike. You know, it just it just wasn't the same. But it, he made it the same. You know, we related to each other. It was so hard. Um, 
going through a divorce. My ex had uh, not accepted the divorce papers. And for a short marriage with no kids, he didn't show up to court. I was just very frustrated because I just wanted the relationship over. And his, for obvious financial reasons, was dragging on forever. Um, And I would like to add that I was in no way, shape, or form the cause of his divorce Um, His divorce had been going on for about seven years prior to this point in time. So at this point, he throws the money. It's impressive that he has this money. It's impressive that he is going away and he's thinking of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And... Also, as you mentioned, you've you've actually known him now for a long time. Everyone in town knows him, and he had bring, like everyone knows his kids, things like that. He's bringing yeah. around celebrity type people. He's vouched for. Yes, you know, definitely. Like this, a big thing here in my mind is. Look at no one here has ever said anything bad about him. It's been a long time since I've known him. And he just seems like a, a guy who loves his kids, mm-hmm. is, is a hard worker, knows the value of hard work, sees that value of hard work in me. Because maybe no one has ever valued how hard I've worked just to be where I am. And yes. now this guy, you know, I'm looking to start a family. I want kids. Here's a guy who's looks the part, says everything correctly, is treating me like I've never been treated before. And I'm sold. You know, yeah. I, we hadn't even gone on a date. We hadn't even met outside of my job and this is the way I'm being treated. You know, I had never experienced anything like this in my life. Um, he got back from his trip in Italy. Um, and during that time I had my birthday, I turned 28. He said, Hey, I want to take you out. I want to make up. I feel really bad. I missed your birthday. Let me take you out. And I still was very reluctant because I still wasn't divorced. And I said, okay, but it's just as friends. Like, you need to understand I'm just your friend. So have you heard of Credit Karma? Because Credit Karma is a place where you can check your credit score for free. And I know a lot of you are paying down debt, and that can be stressful. I know many of you out there, you uh, weren't even the ones who put yourself in debt. And then there are some of you out there that need to go into debt to hire lawyers in your divorce and for custody cases. And you could be juggling different monthly payment dates on your debt constantly. And Credit Karma not only helps you check your credit score for free, but they can also help you rebuild your credit score. And they can even help you consolidate your debt into one payment loan as well. Just one due date a month and Credit Karma can help you find the best option for you. Credit Karma finds loans that are personal to you and they will even show you your chances of approval. So you can choose between loan offers that you're more likely to get approved for so you can apply with more confidence. And also comparing loan offers on Credit Karma is 100% free and it won't affect your credit scores and it could save you money. Go check out Credit Karma's reviews online. They are fabulous. They're just a really highly rated company. So are you ready to apply? Head to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to see personalized offers. Go to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to find the loan for you. That's creditkarma.com slash loan offers. So he takes me out to the, well, excuse me, let me backtrack. So he tells me to meet him at his house and we'll drive together. I go to his 
home and you know, he's a car dealer. I have regulars who are car dealers. One of my uncles was a car dealer. I had no idea the extent of what kind of money he had until I went to his home. You know, looking at him, he just dressed like the average person. He was not flashy. There's no, you know, flashy jewelry or anything that would indicate he's any different financially from any other person on the street. I go to his home. It, it is an amazing home. It's on 10 acres. Uh, there's three houses. There's a pool house. There's a guest house. There's a gym. There's a home theater. I mean, just like I have never been in a house this nice before in my entire life. Um, I was just in shock. So we drive to dinner and he picks this place that is located in the best shopping mall in our entire state. Takes me shopping. I still am like, ah, I don't really feel good about this, but it's like, okay, we're at Louis Vuitton. Here's a purse. Here's a jacket. Here's a scarf. Let's go to Gucci. Oh my gosh, the salespeople say they've never seen anybody look so good in that dress. And it was just, um, he was like, I feel like I'm with a celebrity. I must be dreaming. You know, people are looking at me and it's only because you're with me. We go to dinner, you know, I'm in the restaurant industry. I really love wine. He's like, whatever. And he knows this because we talked about it. Whatever bottle of wine you want, it's your birthday. I feel bad. I missed your birthday. You pick. Price is not an option. It felt still uncomfortable having someone offer to buy me things and spend the money that he did on me that day. But he kept justifying it. And he kept saying, you know, you're just special. I want to, I have the ability, I just want to make you feel good. I can do it. It's not a hardship on me. You're such a special person. You deserve this. You deserve to get treated like this. But there was one thing that was the most important to me that we did not cover. And like I said, he was a little bit older than me. He already had older children. And for me... My lifelong dream is to be a, a mother, to have the family and be the parent that I never got as a child. I tell him that. And I, before I even pursue a romantic relationship with him, like I said, I'm very practical. I am very like point A to point B. I made sure I said, I want to be a mother I need to know before I get romantic, romantically involved with you that you want to have more children. And of course, he said, yes. He said, you know, every woman deserves to be a mother. Every woman has the right to uh, be a parent. I love it. You know, the greatest joys in my life are my children. He said, but I'm only going to do it once. And that's sort of how we got started. It was very, very, very fast moving relationship. You know, this was November. So, oh, seven. From that point, we started a romantic relationship. And it was, I don't want you to go out after work. Why don't you just come to my house? I'll open a bottle of wine. Um, you know, I have to work early in the morning. I wake up at seven or six and I really don't want to have to worry about you. I worry about you. I don't go to sleep until I know that you're done with work and you're home safe. And when they say love bombing, I don't think anybody's ever been love bombed by a very, I mean, this man uh, bought me a new car within two weeks. You know, your car is really crappy. Take this car. Um, gave me a key to his son's apartment building across the street so that I could park in their garage so I didn't have to pay for parking. Um, 
clo- designer clothing. I loved fashion. So it was designer everything. Diamonds, uh, diamond pendant, diamond earrings, diamond tennis bracelet, Rolexes. It, I mean, it was insane. Whatever, uh, it, I felt like whatever I wanted, I got. And I didn't even ask for it. He knew exactly what to get, exactly what to get me. Um, And in the meantime, it's, you know, um, all that I dream about is having a family, um, a family with you. You've made my life so much better. Um, I'm so successful. And the only thing I'm missing is a woman to share it with. Um, you're my dream girl. You're my soulmate. All that I've ever wanted was to be able to hold hands walking down the street with someone that I'm proud of. Um, yet we're still both going through a divorce. Um, mine finally comes to an end. And he sort of has a a, what I would say a breakdown is very depressed, crying for no reason because my divorce ended, which you would think that we're bonding over how terrible the divorce is in the process. Mine ends. And instead of being happy for me, he's crying and depressed because he still has to go through with his at this point. I am pretty much staying the night at his house every single night. I pretty much moved into his home. Little things started to happen. Like, oh, before I met you, I tried to kill myself. I plotted my suicide. I can't even go to church without taking a pill. Pulls out a huge Ziploc storage bag out of his briefcase full of prescription bottles. You know, starts to really tell me some things that I thought, well, you know, you probably should have told me that before I decided to get in a relationship with you, not after. I have a son. I have another son. I cheated on my wife. I have a, you know, 12 year old son who lives in another state. I have uh, a disease that you can catch. I am depressed. I, you know, I'm on all these antidepressants, but you make me not want to take my pills. You make me want to be better. You make me, uh, you know, it was like he was putting his happiness in my hands. Um, And I'm just, you know, then it was, I'm so excited for us to be a family. And then he started with the, well, it's time for you to quit your job. Well, before we get to that, I just want to do a little bit of a roundup here of everything that just transpired with what she said. And what he has done here is he's omitted all of these things from you for a very long time. Then he confesses, in a way, all of these things that are going wrong. And he does it in a way where... Uh, you know, poor me. And at that time he has taken the negative focus of what had happened, which was omitting the truth, which is for some people just the same as lying when you're omitting what, uh, certain things. And he then plays the victim. You then tend to him. And the focus is off of the negative type of stuff that's been going on. And then on top of that, he throws in your shared future, what you want, and how you can help him. And for someone like you, who's always been a problem solver, who's always been helpful and come up with solutions with the love bombing that has just occurred, everything negative is is gone. There's no second thought really here and you're going to help him because that's who you are. That's he, yes, he has placed his value or worth in your hands, but it was done in a way where you're now 
on not on your side of the fence anymore. You're going to be tending to his side of the fence, putting you in his court. Yes. And he would, you know, after he would do that, after he would tell me these little bits and pieces of information, he would maybe send me a text and say how much he loves me. And he understands if I don't want to be with him anymore, or he would say, I've got to go to work. Um, but I have hepatitis and by this time him and I have had unprotected sex and yeah, there's a possibility you could have it and leaves work crying or leaves, excuse me, the house crying. You know, it's like things like that where it's, a very emotionally charged and putting his emotions and his fate in my hands. And he's using guilt. I still thought, my gosh, that's a little weird. You know, like, wouldn't you tell somebody this before they move in with you, before you commit to having a family? But he just then would come, you know, come home from work or I would come home from work and act like nothing happened. And we would just not talk about it. And just resume our life. Um, and then, like I said, he started wanting me to quit my job. How he got me to quit my job is he started taking me on trips. So um, unbeknownst to me, he had a private, he had a jet. He has homes all over the United States. And he also has car dealerships in all of these areas. I didn't know. I thought he was just a local you know, car guy with some local car dealerships. So I am going to islands. I am going to ritzy cities on a private plane. I've never, I, I've only at this point been on a commercial plane once before in my entire life. And I'm flying private. Um, we're going to the Super Bowl. We're sitting next to celebrities. We are going to the Masters Golf Tournament. Um, Like once in a lifetime events for some people, this is, you know, a weekend for me. And that was sort of how I quit my, or why I quit my job. Um, Because he was like, this is what I want to do with my life. Like I have all this money. I just want to enjoy it with you. And this is what our life is going to be like. But the biggest thing that really like hooked me and got me was when I got sick. Um, I have bad asthma and would get very bad uh, respiratory infections. So I was sick one day, very sick and was really having problems even breathing. And he takes me to the hospital where, you know, he funds the medical research at the hospital. So we get the red carpet treatment. I don't wait, you know, I'm in the emergency room. I don't wait. I go right in, I get taken care of by the top doctor in the area um, for, you know, respiratory illness. And he's like, no, you're not going to put it on your insurance. He just hands a credit card, buys me my, this respiratory machine that's super expensive, takes me home, you know, is taking care of me, giving me soup, giving me breakfast in bed, just totally catering to me. And that to me, I was like, wow, I've never had anybody take care of me like that. Ever. It's always been me taking care of other people or me taking care of myself. And I thought, okay, this guy really loves me. He just proved he's really going to take care of me. This Pride, everyone's coming through for the Trevor Project on YouTube Shorts. Join us. Create a short showing how you're stepping up for Pride using the hashtag YouTube Pride Challenge. Come through for Pride on YouTube Shorts. Visit YouTube.com backslash Pride. Um, And that's really all I ever wanted in life was someone to be there for me, someone to show me 
that they cared about me and who, you know, that then translated to me, like, he's going to be a great father. If we have children, he's this doting on me when I'm sick, he's going to be so great, you know, as a dad. And this also seems to be the first time in your life where, you know, because you are not working or been told, hey, we're doing all these trips, you have to be available. This is really the first time for you where you've never been working since the age of or since like grade five. Right, right. And for you, that must be heaven. In a, in a way, it because, was. because you were, you were probably exhausted. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was unbelievable. I had, we had neighbors and he said, you, you must feel like a Disney princess. He's, he's like, it just must be like a dream. You know, one day you're, you're managing a restaurant and the next day you're flying in a private plane going to a private island. And it was, I mean, it was very, it was like a dream come true, you know? Before things started going downhill, he wooed my family. He paid off all my mother's debt, gave her $10,000 to keep in the bank. So she had financial security, bought my sister a car, um, we would go on lavish family vacations for my mom, her boyfriend. For them, they were sold to the, the image and the message of family. Like, I care about family. Your family is my family. A couple months after I quit my job, I found out I was pregnant. Which, again, also, dream come true. That's all I've ever wanted in my life was to be a mother um, have a family of my own. And here I have this dream guy who's absolutely in love with me and is going to be the best dad. I find out when we go to the doctor that I uh, was pregnant with identical twins. So the day after I went to the doctor and we found out that I was pregnant with twins, I get a phone call. And I guess I should say that he was always on the phone. He had two phones. Um, and I just thought he was working, you know, all the time. It's He's very successful. He's got, you know, all these businesses all over the United States. I get a call from his girlfriend that he is still dating, that he is never broken up with, that he took the trip to Italy. She is living in his home, one of his homes that he told me he owned, um, that we never visited, but we had made plans to go to this home. Um, and I just was devastated. Um, finding out from her that the formula is the same. She proceeds to tell me in chronological order Everything that he had done for me. So um, a car, diamonds, Rolexes, trips, quit your job. It's It was in the exact same order. I was in shock. I, I didn't, I didn't understand how the, he was hiding this number one and number two, how I didn't know. So she, this woman pretty much tells me she knows I'm pregnant and that I'm living her life and I'm living the life that she's supposed to have. Um, I still hadn't told him about the girlfriend calling me, but I did. I, I held it in for so long. I finally told him he... Uh, was so mad that I didn't tell him. So we're walking through the gold district in Florence, and he stops into a jewelry store and buys me a ring and says, let's just move past this. I fully intend on being a family with you. I fully intend on marrying you. You know, I never saw her. It was just so hard for me to break up with her. 
So I just didn't break up with her. I just talked to her. I just strung her along. I've never seen her. I've never cheated on you. I love you, you know, and I bought it. And I sort of was stuck, too. Um, he even sat and had me sit in a room with him and write an email to her saying, I'm with, I'm with this woman. I'm sure, you know, she told me you guys talked, we're having twins. I love her. I'm sorry. I did this to you. Um, and he sent the email. So I saw somehow to me, that was okay. Um, I don't know how in my mind that became okay, but it was okay. So I remember him telling me a constant thing that he would always say is I can't be alone. I don't like to be alone. And that was one of the reasons he used for getting me to quit my job is he didn't want to be alone. So we got back to Italy or from Italy back to normal life. Um, he was acting very strange, disappearing more, started going to work more. Um, going on trips, going on golf outings. And in the meantime, I am being trained is what I call it. I'm being trained how to cook the way he likes, the food he likes, um, cleaning. Um, now it's my responsibility to pack for him. Every single time he goes somewhere, I am responsible for packing his things. And it's just, you know, he would say, well, it's just a little something. I do so much for you. That's the least you can do for me. Um, whatever he wanted, I was doing it for him because he provided so much for me that he just asked for this little thing. And it's really, when you look at it, it's not taking that much time out of my day. Uh, slowly, he became my number one priority above anything, above family he started to phase out my friends. You know, you're going to be a mother now. And this, all this girl does is goes out and she drinks and she's single or she's trashy or they're not good enough for you. Uh, you're so much better than them. After all of this stuff, just to backtrack a little bit, when I found out that this, he had this girlfriend and never broke up with her, um, he gave me his passwords to everything. So I had his email password. I had, you know, the numbers to unlock his phone. But he wanted mine as well. And I gladly gave it to him. At this point, we were still traveling. Um, I was pregnant. I was able to travel. The pregnancy was really going well. Um, but he was still being secret. He was still you know, going outside, talking on his phone or going on a bike ride or finding excuses to go and talk on his phone. Um, we were at our home. Coincidentally, he has a lot of homes on islands. <laughs> so we were on a home on an island. Um, and I found out that this particular girlfriend uh, was suing him. And she sued him, so he bought her a home, a house. She basically sued him, and he never told me about it. I was very upset. I think the, it had boiled over from the dishonesty, um, from you know maybe me not even dealing with it the first time. We got into a huge fight. He threatened suicide. I don't even think I remember some of it. That's how terrible it was. You know, we got on the plane, went back home, more love bombing, you know, getting ready for the kids, getting ready for the babies. So the girls were born um, seven and a half weeks early. They stayed in the NICU for two weeks. Uh, we had to stay in Michigan, you know, for them to get their shots and their doctor's appointments. I knew something was going on because he was very unavailable. I believe when I got home after delivering the girls, they were still in the hospital. I came across an email because I was checking. You know, there was something in my head that said, this isn't right. Something's going on. Normal people 
especially people that are the father of your children, answer the phone in front of you. They don't disappear. They're not unavailable. Um, he started saying, oh, you're crazy. You're nuts. There's nothing going on. It's just, you know, pregnancy brain or you're just imagining things. And I found an email from that same woman. Um, they had still been communicating, still been talking. I felt so upset, so betrayed. I confronted him. And he, uh, instead of admitting it, said I was crazy, said I was impossible to be with, got out an engagement ring uh, with a very large diamond on it and threw it at me. And it said, it, this is your fault that you don't get a romantic proposal and a romantic engagement because you're accusing me of things. So, sorry, once he does that, what is going on with you where, like, he has that tantrum after being caught? Where do you go? Like, what goes on in your mind? Are you trying to justify things? Are you angry? Are you waiting? It's, are you like, what? what's kind of going know. on with you? It, I mean, I had just given birth. My, my children aren't even in the same house. You know, they're still in the hospital. I am trying to get them out. I'm pumping. I am going in to breastfeed them. I, it just, and it just, I don't even know where I was at in my headspace because it was all so crazy. It was all so crazy. So, um, you're, so really, right here, you are overwhelmed with the pregnancy, with where the kids are, just with life in general. You find, you know, that he has not stopped talking to this person, and at that point, there are so many things going on that you don't even know where to begin. Right. And he's twisting it, saying nothing's going on. You're crazy. And you're you the believe crazy that? one. Do you believe that? Sort of. I mean, I, I knew, you know, you have a gut feeling, but then somebody tells you nothing's going on. You're crazy. Like I can talk to her. I'm not having sex with her. I can talk to her. You're crazy. You're possessive. You're nuts. So since you didn't have the 100% proof in your mind of what cheating was, which is sleeping with someone else, or at least that's his definition, at that yes. point, there's a kernel of truth to what he's saying, and therefore, yes. it's over. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not harming anyone. I'm just talking to her. I'm just emailing her. I haven't seen her in person. Um. But it, it literally made me feel like in my mind that I was crazy because I knew something was going on. Um, I mean, at that point, he had trained me subconsciously, I think, to be so attentive to his needs and so caring for him. I could look at him and I could say, bless you like 10 seconds before he sneezed because I even knew when he was going to sneeze. That's how in tune with him and his needs and how I had to cater to him. I was, that was my life. I think the reason that I kept allowing it is because I was like, okay, you can do this. Like you're not going to be the reason that your kids grow up without two parents. You can make it this, you know, it's not that. And then I would justify it to myself. Like, oh, it's not that bad. He's probably not cheating, really cheating on you. He's just emailing. Like, you have these two infant kids who are still in the hospital. You need to just make an effort and move on. And he's going to get better. And he said he's not going to do it again. You need to believe him. And so we just moved on. Went back to normal life. Um we go to our other island home for the summer. 
um, with the au pair, all the gear. Um, at this point, the girls were seven months old. He's acting weird. He's encouraging me to go out, take the au pair out, show her, you know, she's from this foreign country. She's young. She just wants to have a good time, get the girls to bed, and you guys can go out and have a fun night. This episode is brought to you by Cheetos Deja Tu Huella. Deja Tu Huella means leave your mark, and that's exactly what Latinos are doing all across the country. They're rewriting the rules and pushing the boundaries in their communities to leave their own unique mark. They use their gift, their superpoder, to make an impact, whether it's through art, music, fashion, food, or something else. And Cheetos will celebrate what they're doing by shining a light on their transformative power. The Deja Tu Huella program celebrates those leaving their mark in Latino communities. You can also celebrate by checking out the new podcast, Batman Unburied, on Spotify. Batman Unburied is presented by Cheetos Deja Tu Huella. Visit Batman Unburied on Spotify to learn more. Um, I remember him telling me his wife caught his ex-wife, caught him cheating on him by tape recording him when he was in his bedroom. When I went on this island, I brought a tape recorder with me because I still had that I am crazy feeling. He still was behaving oddly. I knew something was going on. And so for him to encourage me to go out is it was odd. So I thought something's going on. Something is happening. He would never want me out of the house. I always have to be with him. You know, I'm supposed to take care of him. Um, so I got the recorder and I uh, hit it in the room. One of those little like audio recorders. Um, I got home and sure enough, he is having a phone conversation with that same woman who he bought a house for, who had sued him, who was his girlfriend, who he never broke up with. And I hear him telling her that he loves her, that he's going to leave me. He's taking the kids. They're going to have the life that they always dreamed of. I was devastated because, I mean, I just felt like an idiot. I felt stupid. Um, so, you know, meanwhile, I'm crazy, right? I'm, I know something's going on. I know he's having what I believed to be an emotional affair, um, I woke him up and confronted him. He denied it. He completely denied it. You're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. So I had, I actually had to get the tape recorder out and play back the conversation for him, for him to actually even admit that he was still having a conversation with this woman. And these were the things that he said. And that's what I heard. Um, so I said I wanted to leave. I was done. I'm leaving. Um, he got very violent with me. Um, he broke, punched me in the face, broke my glasses in half that were on my face. Um, I tried to call 911. He broke my cell phone. He smashed the home phone. Um, I was on an island. He took my driver's license. He took all of my credit cards. I felt trapped. I was trapped. And he started saying, you're never going to leave me. I own you. You're not allowed to leave. If you try and leave, I'm going to kill you. Locked me in the room overnight. I had my computer. I wrote an email to my family stating what had happened, I wrote an email to the woman. I had her email address, and I said, here you go. He's all yours. Like, you think you're going to take my children and raise them 
it, go ahead, like go be with this abuser, go for it. I didn't sleep at all. And the next morning he was so apologetic, just, you know, I've never had the excuses. I've never had a relationship, so I'm messing it up on purpose. I've never, I don't know what it's like to have a good relationship. I'm not, I'm, I'm capable. Um, and if you leave, it'll be your fault that your daughters will grow up in two different homes. And, you know, threatening, I'm going to take you to court. You have no money. You haven't worked. Even if I wanted to get off of the island, he still had my driver's license and he had all of my credit cards. So I couldn't even get myself an airplane ticket. I couldn't get on the ferry to get home. I had no way of getting out of there. I was trapped. So here's an instance where, you know, you not having your own money becomes a problem, the financial abuse of it, where you are now reliant on him. He is also blaming you, but at the same time saying that he needs you, that these, you know, that the the children need you. And in, in that sense, so there's this kind of circular mix of message going on that's very confusing uh, to be mm-hmm. in, and you're trapped at the same time. So it's not like you can just leave and get out of this type of circular getting angry and blaming and then needing you type of conversation, you have to sit there. Yeah, I have to sit there. I have to take it. Um, And I have seven month old children, infants that I was taking care of. I was responsible for them. I felt the deep rooted issues of me not having a good family life made me stay with him because I didn't want that for my children. And and he was telling me that it'll be your fault. You know, it's your fault that your children will have two households. It's, it'll be your fault because I'm a great guy. I am, you know, I have all this money. You have everything you could have ever dreamed of. And I stayed. Um, It was at that point, you know, we were engaged, engaged. Um, It was at that point where he wrote down, he actually did a written contract with me, wrote it down as a promise. You know, that's what he always used to say. When I say something, I do it. You don't ever have to wonder if I'm going to do something. If I say something, I'm going to do it. So he wrote a contract and said, Within the next year, we were going to get married. And he knew that that was so important to me, getting married, um, having a family, being having that role model for our daughters. And said, you can pick any single place that you want in the entire United States. Have your dream wedding. You can have it. And he put it in a contract. And then he also put in the contract that he was not speaking to this woman ever again and that he would never financially provide anything for any other woman again. Um, That was good enough for me to move on with the relationship. But then the wedding was in the marriage was the dangling. Um, If I didn't cook dinner right, it was, oh, well, you wonder why I don't want to marry you. You don't even know how to cook. Or um, a lot of things with my looks, like, oh, you're lucky you're so pretty. Or you're lucky you're beautiful because you sure aren't smart. Or you sure are a bad cook. Or, you know, you just don't know. And it was always, like, um, putting me down all the time. So after this contract is is signed and all these promises happen in some way there's a clean slate or at least the cycle can begin again and now there's this dangling carrot of marriage but the marriage never happens and it's always this continually continuous dangling 
carrot. So what are, I guess, the ebbs and the flows of, you know, these things happening where you know, the cycles occur, the booms happen, the busts happen? Are there changing tactics or is it just this continuous kind of like nitpicking that happens? Um, I think that what started to happen is he would just go away for longer periods of time. And so it became more tolerable. Um, at this point, he was purchasing a lot more dealerships all over the country. Uh, the girls were at the age where they needed to be in school. So traveling around to all of these homes and doing all of this wasn't possible. So we stayed home. We went to preschool. You know, um, he would go do his thing. We would stay home. Um, in the meantime, you know, things got worse. The verbal abuse got worse. I became far more financially dependent on him. We uh, built a hum my dream home. So that kept me busy. Um, like I said, the ante just kept getting bigger. If he made a mistake, it was a bigger uh, reward, you know, if I stayed. Um, also, you know, nothing was in my name. The homes were in LLCs and the businesses. The cars were in LLCs and the businesses. The only thing conveniently that were in my name were all of the bills. And for people who don't know, an LLC is a limited liability company. So in the aftermath, if you tried to sue something like that, the liability and ability to sue them isn't as, uh, is not as easy as it would be if it was a regular divorce, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and the LLC was the trust or the actual business in which he had the control and power over removing or adding at any given point. So within this time, I assume you, you catch him cheating again. So at the beginning when you were seen and you were appreciated and everything you were seen for your hard work, that is now gone. And now you are being dehumanized and you are seen as less than him. Yes. And as far as your mental stability during this time, are are you in the realm of uh, not suicide, maybe suicidal, but you've really lost what is up, down, left, or right? Or are you still able to know exactly um, when all the gaslighting and all that stuff is occurring? I think I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. I think I'm alone. You know, I remember days just like when the kids were young and I'm alone the whole day and all that I wanted was someone to talk back to me in full sentences. You know, I'm alone. Um, I was sad at this point. You know, I had told my family enough and they just the sympathy really wasn't there. It was sort of like, oh, my goodness, it's just more drama, you know, Um there were more women, um, and with the women, it got more daring or even in a more perverse way for him. He now was putting us together. So he would put me in a room with a woman that I believe he was cheating on me with, and he got some sort of sick perverted happiness out of that. There were two women that I know of at least three actually where um, one, one was an employee, two were employees of his and they actually ended up suing him for sexual harassment. Um, and that's how I found out about all of the uh, infidelity, attempted infidelity. Um, and I was just on my own. I was living in my dream home, in my dream town, 
I had apparently, according to him, every woman's dream. I had a credit card with no budget. I had no bills. I had beautiful kids, but I was miserable. I wasn't happy. You know, wait, was it Birkin wait, wait, bags. Sorry, was it difficult for you to get empathy from anyone because of the lifestyle you were living, which yes. then drove you yeah. into further isolation. Because at that point, yes. how many people in reality of how wealthy you were at that point or your, or your ex was, how many peers do you actually have in that sense? The, um, what I was going through, it, I couldn't talk about it to anybody because you feel ridiculous. You feel stupid. And it's, it's just so much drama. Um, so it's that. And then the people that I care about and the people that are closest to me, I feel like are the ones who are like, oh, poor baby, you know, you're flying around on a private plane. You're not happy. Like, oh, what a bad life. You know, I didn't go on vacation this year at all. And I'm not getting the sympathy and the support that I need from the people who are closest to me um, because of the financial aspect. So was there a final straw uh, before the end happened? Yes. So there was a final straw when it came to another woman. And then there was a final straw with my children. Um, We had signed the contract. He had promised me. He had given his word. He was not going to financially support any more women because, again, a man like that doesn't go out and buy you a home and not expect anything in return. Actually, I don't think anybody is going to buy you a home ever and expect anything in return. And my kids started noticing the abuse. Um, I was driving to school one day with my kids and they said, mom, I know how to spell the word bitch. It's B I T C H. And that's what dad calls you all the time. And their sweet little voices are telling me, dad doesn't love you. Dad's me. Dad yells you at you. You need a boyfriend. You need to get somebody who loves you. You're a nice mom. You need somebody to buy you flowers. So All of this time, I felt like I was doing all of this to hold my relationship together and be in this relationship to provide the childhood and to provide the family that I never had as a child. It turns out I'm doing the exact opposite for my children, and I'm letting them see their mother get mistreated. I am probably you know, teaching them that it's okay to get treated this way by a man. I sat down with my ex and told him that I knew he bought this woman a home. And I gave him a chance to take it back and that we needed to go get counseling. And he looked at me and he said, it's my money. I'll do whatever I want with it. And if you don't like it, you can go do something else. So it took me a while to um, get the courage up to leave. Um, He had bought another home in the same town that we lived in. So we had two homes and I believed that he had it so he could cheat Um, so I packed a bag and I took the girls and I went and stayed at that home. It was hard. I mean, I, I wasn't who I was, you know, I, at one point in my life, I was strong. I didn't need anybody. I wasn't dependent on anyone. And now here I am and I have nothing literally like I've got nice clothes, but I have no car. I have no job. I have no home and I have two children. So eventually he realizes that I'm not going to come back and he tries everything, all of the tactics, you know, it's I'm nice. I'll do whatever you want. 
I'll give you $500,000 for every single year that you've been with me. And for every year after, I'll give you a million dollars. I'll put the company in your name. I'll put the houses in your name. Just every single last thing trying to be nice. Then it turned into crying if he didn't get me to come back. Like, I'm depressed. I'm going to kill myself again. Uh, I can't live my life without you than to um, mean and threatening and he's going to make me pay and he's going to take the girls away from me and, um, you know, he's going to kick me out of the house. I'm going to have nowhere to live. At this point, all of the credit cards are in my name, um, but he pays the bills. They go to his accountant. I'm getting deposits from his bank coming into my account every single month. Those stop. So I have no money. He has this, like, fix-it lawyer who works um, with all of his dealerships and sort of just fixes things. Um, He's the lawyer who fixed all of his sexual harassment, all, all of the lawsuits that my ex had. This is also a man who I've spent family vacations with that I've cooked dinner for. This man drafts up a parenting agreement. And I am told that either I sign it or he's kicking me out onto the street with the girls. And at this point, hasn't even seen the girls at all. Not once. Um. I had only been gone in their lives maybe three total weekends. And they're in first grade at this point. Um, In this document, he gets 50-50 custody of the children. And we're not going to file it in the state that we're in, that the girls, you know, are going to school in, because he doesn't he's not a resident of the state and he is so terrified of getting caught paying state income taxes that he will not allow me or will not allow the document to be filed in any court and i didn't even have a lawyer anyways because i was told if i went to a lawyer it was going to be bad that he was going to kick me out that i couldn't have representation when I signed this legal document. I I signed it. Uh, This legal document had an NDA in it. It had punishments. If I told anyone, I basically signed a legal document that I would spend the next two and a half years trying to unwind. So after you signed this, where did you go? And what was, I guess, the repercussions of signing it, and how did you eventually unwind it? Um, I signed it. I stayed. If I signed it, I stayed in the house. I got the money that I was getting um, back again. I got a car. But then he wasn't happy with the agreement. So he put another one in front of me. I signed that one, and it was just a modification. It wasn't a new agreement. It was a modification. It gave me more money for child support, and it allowed me to move out of the home. Um, At this point, I didn't feel safe in that house anyways. He had hired private investigators. I was being followed. I think I was followed for an entire summer. I was being accused of being a lesbian. I had friends and um, family members from my home state who called me and said, hey, this, you know, this is really interesting. I heard this, that I'm a lesbian, that I left him, or that I was cheating on him. So now I'm the cheater, even though, you know, he had me followed for a straight summer, pretty much, and there were no pictures of any cheating. I was a cheater. So you were not allowed to discuss anything because of the NDA, but he could go out and smear you in any way he wanted. Yes. Because that was not in there at all. 
Yes. And he was allowed because the amount of money that I was getting in retrospect to his wealth was like pennies. But to the normal person, oh, my gosh, you're getting how much a month in child support? So what happens from here when you finally say enough is enough? Well, my kids are suffering. They are going over to his house. They're having mental breakdowns. They're crying. Um, They don't want to go over there. They're miserable. And the reality is they weren't really, it says 50-50 on paper, but they're not really there 50% of the time because he is incapable of taking care of children at this age. So... When I moved into this house, um, I had a neighbor down the street, and he had gone through a divorce, and he had started giving me books, like going through the divorce, how to deal with it with your kids, and he gave me his divorce attorney's phone number. So I called her, and I met with her. And that's sort of how we decided that we were going to um, file it in the state and through the court system. Um, So I filed for a restraining order simultaneous with a uh, civil lawsuit and a child custody lawsuit, all in one. My uh, restraining order was granted or temporary, and my lawyer and his lawyers worked out, you know, a uh, visitation, which he never visited the kids once. Um, immediately when he got served, he immediately violated the restraining order. He immediately called me, then um, immediately came over to my home, violating it again. I was fearful of him because of what had happened, and he also had a plane that was unmarked, and I was very fearful that he would take the girls. Our fights became worse towards the end, and, you know, there were threats. He did say, if you ever leave me, I'm going to kill you. Um, I didn't find out until later that I have PTSD, and I blocked out maybe one of the most violent exchanges between the two of us where I actually had a witness. Um, I don't even remember it. And um, I feel like if I would have put that in my restraining order, then my restraining order would have been granted. Um, I had a small town. She's very good, but again, a very small town lawyer. He went out and hired a celebrity lawyer who boasts on her Uh, YouTube and her page that if you're not worth a hundred million dollars, she won't take you as a client. So little old me, small farm town girl is going up against like pit bull divorce attorney to the stars. We still had the child custody stuff to go through. Um, And it was a long, long, long road to unwind what I had already signed But I did it. Eventually. I get there. Um, We separated the civil lawsuit with a child custody. Um, I decided that I wanted to do the child custody stuff first because that was the most important. But I wanted him to take the civil side seriously. And so my lawyer filed a $50 million civil lawsuit against him for a breach of contract. And in my state, there was a case called Marvin versus Marvin. 
And it is basically a court case where promises made between partners, they don't necessarily have to be married or spouses, can be withheld or can be upheld, excuse me, in the court system, that it's a service or a good. And so therefore, it qualified me to file a a financial claim against him in a civil court because he promised to provide for me for the rest of my life. He, I had several documents in writing where he made that promise. So that's sort of a way I, that was one of the things I guess that people aren't aware of is that you do have a right if you're not married to be financially supported. And that's sort of how we went through that. Um, our child custody stuff is ongoing, still is still ongoing. Um, we've gone through a custody evaluator or an evaluation. Uh, we went all the way through it the day before he was supposed to have his psych evaluation He called me crying, saying he can't handle it, and caved to everything that I wanted for the child custody, but still couldn't follow that. At one point in court, I had 75 uh, counts of contempt for violating our family court agreement. Um, He was found guilty. Unfortunately, the only thing they sentenced him to was... uh, community service. And he took that community service and had someone turn it into a photo shoot and then sent the pictures of him doing this community service to everyone like, hey, look at me. I'm not above giving back to my community. He sent these pictures out to everyone like he was did it on his own, not that he was forced to in a court of law. Um, he made it into a full PR event. For, oh, yes. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's, that's pretty amazing. It's on uh, his, uh, like it's, it's te- on it's his terrible. website. Sorry, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's terrible, but it's pretty crafty uh, yeah. on his end of taking that and then flipping it that way. Yeah. So... That didn't work, obviously. Our, uh, we just, so then we went in again. It took me forever to get into another custody evaluation. In the meantime, he has, we have a parent coordinator. He has bribed the parent coordinator. Um, he bought her a car. She's now doing things for him that I know she's bribed. Um, I'm begging her to not allow him to drink alcohol while he has the kids. She says, no, I'm getting phone calls. I mean, it's unbelievable, this stuff that has happened. I get phone calls when I'm at dinner and my children are crying because the ambulance is at their house because my ex has mixed prescription pills and has been drinking and passed out on the floor. Um, My parent coordinator still would not say he couldn't drink alcohol when he had the kids. So then I would just have to take it to the judge and the judge would say, yes. Um, He used and created this real sob story for everyone. And it works. It works, especially on like middle aged women. Um, And so that's who he would try and have be our, you know, our family counselor, we went to, uh, they ordered us to do family counseling, six family counselors later, everybody quits the first time or second time. Um, Co parenting counseling, same scenario, everybody quits, no one wants anything to do with us. Um, his sob story is, you know, I, I 
was the love of his life and he never did anything wrong and all he ever did was provide, provide, provide. Then I cheat on him and I sue him for $50 million and all that he has left in his life to do in this world is raise those girls. And, you know, he's so generous and he gives all this money to all of these charities and these people just fell over so trying to listen to him. So, you know, he's crafted this perfect story. He delivers this story with his charisma, with his money kind of driven behind it. The woe is me tale that will just right now just continue. He'll continue to do it. So now that you're still dealing with, you know, child custody, uh, you know, day to day here. Uh, I guess, what is your life like now as far as you and your healing? And, um, you know, is are you in the place of even healing yet? Or are you still waiting for this, um, you know, for your kids to get a chance to heal? Well, I have been lucky enough to find a wonderful, wonderful therapist for the girls. Um She's been their therapist for the past five plus years because that's how long this has been going on. Um, she is a real stand up person. So I am so thankful for her in the girls' lives. Um, as far as me, I am healing. Um, like I said, I found out I had PTSD. Um, and have blacked out a lot of memories and a lot of bad things that have happened. But it's very hard because every single week there's always something that comes up with him and his behavior and things that he is doing that I have to use my time wisely because I have the children the majority of the time. Um, I have to be there for them. And so it's sort of like, okay. I've got an hour long therapy session this week. What am I, what's the most important thing that I need to address? And I'll deal with all the other stuff later. Um, I was in a woman's support group that helped greatly. I made friends with um, a lawyer. She was in the group. She was able to provide me with so much good advice and support for me where I'm at in my life. I'm trying to move on. I'm trying to rebuild. Um, and if you have any words of wisdom or advice for others, what would it be? I have so much. I feel like I can provide so much, you know, make sure that you don't number one, don't sign any legal documents without being represented by a lawyer. Um, get a good lawyer early and document and journal early. Um, if someone hits you and it, the last lawyer I just saw told me this and I just, I don't know why it seems like common knowledge, but no one has ever like outright said this to me. If someone hits you in a relationship, go to the hospital immediately, go to the emergency room. Uh, no nude photographs or videos because those will come back to haunt you. Um, you have the ability to create a conflict of interest when you're visiting and interviewing lawyers. So, and lawyers won't tell you this because it's not considered ethical, but if you live in a town where you might not necessarily be able to afford the lawyer. You can schedule an hour long appointment and pay their hourly fee. Tell them your story. And then your ex cannot use that person to represent them because it's a conflict of interest. Oh, wow. I didn't even think of that. Yes. So that's a way, you know, if you're finance, if you don't, if you're financially struck, yeah, it's, you know, four or five, $200, but 
it's a way that you've told your story first. So that lawyer now only knows your side of the story. So they cannot represent your ex. Also, narcissists, if you really break it down, they, if you listen careful, carefully enough, they tell you what they're going to do. You just have to listen. They reveal what they're going to do. If you learn and study their behavior, you can predict their next move, putting everything you can possibly think of in your custody agreement. You know, your kids might be young, but put in there who's going to pay for college, who's paying, who's responsible for paying on a down payment on a home. Put in screen time, put in um, boarding school for high school or college choices. Um, it's okay to not read all of your court documents, um, especially when you're dealing with an abuser. They tend to re-traumatize you through the court documents. If you have a good lawyer, your lawyer can read those for you, and you don't have to re-traumatize yourself by going through and hearing about, you know, how terrible of a mother you are or this or that, um, unless it's imperative you don't need to do that and you should ask your lawyer to withhold that stuff from you um with narcs you shouldn't be having conversations with them it's email or text only the phone conversations continue the abuse the biggest thing i've had to accept through this whole thing is the profound grief that my daughter's father will not be who they want him to be or who I want them, him to be um, because he simply isn't capable of being that person. And I've been let down and so have they and been so disappointed by thinking, yeah, even though these are his kids, he would always do what's best for them. And that's just simply not the case. Making your kids and giving them the opportunity to be able to care for themselves when they're at the other home. Making sure they're able to cook and prepare meals for themselves. Um, putting themselves to bed, doing homework, time management, uh, responsible for activities. I know it's hard, but they will have to grow up quick. And I don't think that the other parent really has the capability of doing that stuff. Trying to minimize the trauma for the kids by conditioning them to not expect a lot from the other parent. Um, but not saying it in a way that is uh, disparaging. So phrases like, oh, that's just the way stuff is at your dad's house, or that's just who your dad is. Um, is a way to acknowledge their feelings and acknowledge the things that they're going through without saying something negative about the other parent, because that really affects the kids. You know, they're 50% you, they're 50% the other parent. And at the end of the day, they really internalize a lot of that negativity. It's not your responsibility to tell the world who your narc is and use that time and energy to focus on you and your children. It's okay to feel bad. It's okay to feel stupid. It's okay to feel embarrassed. I think I got hung up on that a lot. Like I just couldn't believe, you know, that when I got into my civil case, all of these jewelry pieces that I believed were one of a kind, I was looking at jewelry bills where there were three or four of the same thing. And I just couldn't believe that I didn't realize that this was going on when I was in the situation. And I think I was way too hard on myself. Well, Adelaide, I want to thank you for being on our show today, for sharing your story and you know, your story is, I guess, a symbol of this can happen to anyone in whatever walk of life that you are in, rich or poor. And even in these situations, 
uh, you still found yourself isolated and you still found yourself uh, with threats of being uh, killed and your children have to go through this with uh, your ex uh, whenever they visit and you're still battling it. And I just want to thank you today for coming on and sharing your story. You did a great job telling your story. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much. And for myself in Adelaide, we hope you have a good night. <laughs>